Chapter Two of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Face at the Window. With heavy, sluggish engines, I panted down and came to rest in the dull yellow glow of the field lights. A new world here. The field was flat, caked ooze, cracked and hardened. It sloped upward from the shore toward where, a quarter of a mile away, I could see the dull lights of the settlement, blurred by the gathered night vapors. The field operator shut off his permission signal and came forward. He was a squat, heavy fellow, in wide trousers and soiled white shirt, flung open at his thick throat. The sweat streamed from his forehead. This oppressive heat, I had discarded my flying garb in the descent. I wore a shirt, knee-length pants with hose and wide-soled shoes of the newly fashioned lowland design. What few weapons I dared carry were carefully concealed. No alien could enter Narita bearing anything resembling a lethal weapon. My thick, wide-soled shoes did not look suspicious for one who planned much walking on the caked lowland ooze. But those flat soles were cleverly fashioned to hide a long, keen knife blade like a dirk. I could lift a foot and get the knife out of its hidden compartment with fair speed. This I had in one shoe. In the other was the small mechanism of a radio safety recorder and image finder, with its attendant individual audiophone transmitter and receiver. A miracle of smallness, these tiny contrivances, with batteries, wires, and grids, the whole device could lay in the palm of one's hand. Once past this field inspection, I would rig it for use under my shirt, strapped around my chest, and I had some colored magnesium flares. The field operator came panting. Who are you? Philip Grant from Great New York. I showed him my name etched on my forearm. He and his fellows searched me, but I got by. You have no documents? No. My letter to the president of Narita was written with invisible ink upon the fabric of my shirt. If he had heated it to a temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit or so, and blown the fumes of hydrochloric acid upon it, the writing would have come out plain enough. I said, You'll house and care for my machine? They would care for it. They told me the price, swindlingly exorbitant, for the unwary traveler who might wander down here. All correct, I said cheerfully, and half that much for you and your men if you give me good service. Where can I have a room and meals? Spawn, said the operator, he is the best, fat-bellied from his own good cooking. Take him there, Hugo. I had a gold coin instantly ready, and with a few additional directions regarding my flyer, I started off. It had been hot and oppressive, standing in the field. It was infinitely worse, climbing the mud slope into the village. But my carrier, trudging in advance of me along the dark winding path up the slope, shouldered my bag and seemed not to notice the effort. We passed occasional tube lights strung on poles. They illumined the heavy, rounded crags. A tumbled region, this slope, which once was the ocean floor, twenty thousand feet below the surface. Rifts were here like gullies. Little buttes reared their rounded dome heads, and there were caves and crevices in which deep sea fish once had lurked. For ten minutes or so we climbed. It was past the midnight hour. The village was asleep. We entered its outposts. The houses were small structures of clay. In the gloom, they looked like drab little beehives set in unplanned groups, with paths for streets wandering between them. Then we came to a more prosperous neighborhood. The streets widened and straightened. The clay houses, still with rounded dome-like tops, stood back from the road. 
with wooden front fences and gardens and shrubbery. The windows and doors were like round finger holes plugged into clay by a giant hand. Occasionally the windows, dimly lighted, stared like sleeping giant eyes. There were flowers in all the more pretentious private gardens. Their perfume, hanging in the heavy night air, lay on the village, making one forget the overcurtain of stenching mist. Down by the shore of the Nary Sea, this world of the depths had seemed darkly sinister. But in the village now, I felt it less ominous. The scent of flowers, the street lined in one place by arching giant fronds drowsing and nodding overhead. There seemed a strange exotic romance to it. The sultry air might also have been sensuous. Much further, Hugo? No, we are here. He turned abruptly into a gateway, led me through a garden and to the doorway of a large, rambling, one-story building. The news of my coming had preceded me. A front room was lighted. My host was waiting. Hugo set down my bag, accepted another gold coin, and with a queer, sidelong smile, the incentive for which I had not the slightest idea, he vanished. I fronted my host, this Jacob Spawn, strange fate that should have led me to Spawn and to little Jetta. Spawn was a fat-bellied Dutchman, as the field attendant had said, a fellow of perhaps fifty-five, with sparse gray hair and a heavy-jowled, smooth-shaved face from which his small eyes peered stolidly at me. He laid aside a huge old-fashioned calabash pipe and offered a pudgy hand. Welcome, young man, to Narita. Seldom do we see strangers. The meal which he presently cooked and served me himself was lavishly done. He spoke good English, but slowly, heavily, with the guttural intonation of his race. He sat across the table from me, puffing his pipe while I ate. What brings you here, young lad? A week, you say? Or more, I don't know. I'm looking for oil. There should be petroleum beneath these rocks. For an hour I avoided his prying questions. His little eyes roved me, and I knew he was no fool, this Dutchman, for all his heavy, stolid look. We remained in his kitchen, save for its mud walls, its concave dome roof. It might have been a cookery of the highlands. There was a table, with its tube lights, the chairs, his electron stove, his orderly rows of pots and pans and dishes on a broad shelf. I recalled that it seemed to me a woman's hand must be here, but I saw no woman. No one, indeed, besides Spawn himself, seemed to live here. He was reticent of his own business, however much he wanted to pry into mine. I had felt convinced that we were alone, but suddenly I realized it was not so. The kitchen adjoined an interior back garden. I could see it through the open door oval, a dim space of flowers, a little path to a pergola, an adobe fountain. It was a sort of Spanish patio out there, partially enclosed by the wings of the house. Moonlight was struggling into it. And as I gazed idly, I saw a figure lurking, someone watching us. Was it a boy, observing us from the shadowed moonlit garden? I thought so, a slight half-grown boy. I saw his figure, in short ragged trousers and a shirt blouse, made visible in a patch of moonlight as he moved away and entered the dark, opposite wing of the house. I did not see the boy's figure again, and presently I suggested that I retire. Spawn had already shown me to my bedroom. It was in another wing of the house. It had a window facing the front and a window and door back to the same patio and a door to the house corridor. Sleep well, Mr. Grant. My bag was here on the table under an electrolier. Shall I call you? Yes, I said early. 
He lingered a moment. I was opening my bag. I flung it wide under his gaze. Well, good night. I shall be very comfortable. Thanks. Good night, he said. He went out the patio door. I watched his figure cross the moonlit path and enter the kitchen. The noise of his puttering there sounded for a time. Then the light went out and the house and garden fell into silence. I closed my doors. They sealed on the inside and I fastened them securely. Then I fastened the transparent window panes. I did not undress, but lay on the bed in the dark. I was tired. I realized it now, but sleep would not come. I am no believer in occultism, but there are premonitions which one cannot deny. It seemed now, as I lay there in the dark, that I had every reason to be perturbed, yet I could not think why. Perhaps it was because I had been lying to this innkeeper stoutly for an hour past, and whether he believed me or not for the life of me, I could not now determine. I sat up on the bed presently and adjusted the wires and diaphragms of the ether wave mechanism. When in place, it was all concealed under my shirt. As I switched it on, the electrodes against my flesh tingled a little, but it was absolutely soundless, and one gets used to the tingle. I decided to call Hanley. The New York wave sorter handled me promptly, but Hanley's office was dead. As I sat there in the darkness, annoyed at this, a slight noise forced itself on me, a scratching, a tap, something outside my window. Spawn, come back to peer in at me. I slipped noiselessly from the bed. The sound had come from the window which faced the patio. The room over by the bed was wholly dark. The moon outside showed the patio window as a dimly illumined oval. For a moment, I crouched on the floor by the bed. No sound. The silence of the lowlands is as heavy and oppressive as its air. I felt as though my heart were audible. I lifted my foot, extracted my dirk. It opened into a very businesslike steel blade of a good twelve-inch length. I bared the blade. The click of it, leaving the flat, hollow handle, sounded loud in the stillness of the room. A moment. Then it seemed that outside my window a shadow had moved. I crept along the floor, rose up suddenly at the window, and stared at a face peering in at me, a small face framed by short, clustering, dark curls. A girl. End of Chapter 2